Hi, Patrick. Hi, Martina. Hi. So I'll be hosting today since Ankita and Jennifer are both away. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if you, you got the news, but yeah, uh, I was a backup. So yeah, I'll try my best to host for the first time. Um, do you want to try out your, your uh, to share your slides before we start? Sure, I can do that real quick. Yeah, stop sharing mine. Uh, That look good? Yeah, looks perfect. Just quick, make sure movies. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, you can keep it up if you want to, whatever you prefer. Uh, it's, um, yeah, we can do it if you want, that's easier. Yeah, you're the only one today, so. And you're fine with this being a uh, live stream on YouTube, right? Yeah. Perfect. So where are Ankita and Jen? Uh, so Jen has a doctor's appointment and uh, Ankita is traveling back to India at the moment. So, or she got there last week. So yeah, she's renewing her visa and, and visiting family. So. Gotcha. How are things over there? I met you during the GRC during the summer. Yeah, this no, um, things are going great. Uh, it's finally turned really nice weather. So it's a little bit like a shock to the system. It's like 70 degrees and sunny today, which oh, wow. yeah. you know, wasn't quite prepared for, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's better than snow at this time of year. Exactly, right? hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I actually had a question for you while we're just sitting here. Um, sure. Have you done any TFM with a good um, uh, like integrin expression, like stain, like a GFP or anything like that? Um. So during my PhD in Johannes lab, I used this um, rush construct of interim alpha five. So with that, we can release interim neosynthesized interims from the ER to go mm -hmm. to the tap membrane. So that's the only thing, but um, but otherwise I haven't had any other expression of, of interims at the same time. Okay. We've been playing around with it a little bit and it's been kind of frustrating that um, some constructs don't really look like they're behaving nicely, like, uh, or they look like they behave okay in certain constructs, but not other ones. So yeah, thinking about different integrin constructs and where they might come from, who we could ask. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this was the interim alpha five subunit, but it has like a bit of extra domains to it. So I'm not sure how useful that would be. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would I would assume that you know any alpha subunit would be better than a beta subunit. But um, but yeah, otherwise I'm not really sure if I could help you with that. <laughs> That's fine. All right, I have to close this quickly to make the Zoom people yeah. smaller. <laughs> otherwise, I'm going to see everyone and not my own slides. Yeah. There we go. And then so this is the last one for this uh, for the spring, correct? Yes, that's what I've understood. Yeah. That's kind then, of awesome. need to jump in there. Yeah, it, it should be the last one of this, but we're gonna have the summer again uh, during the, the fall. In the fall, okay. So take yeah. the summer off. And, and, uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I will need to double check with with Ankita and Jennifer, but, but I assume so. Yeah, and there will be news on the Twitter page as okay. soon as as soon as there is a schedule. So it makes sense because summer everyone's traveling around and doing. Yeah, thing. yeah. We wait a few more minutes for people to drop in. Sure. Before we start. What cells are you using for the TFM experiments? 
So we've done a bunch of them. For the one, the ones I'm uh, currently thinking about, we're just doing fiberglass. So yeah. they form nice, big, chunky adhesions, and it should be yeah. pretty yeah. Uh, we just, yeah, we haven't had a great luck expressing the integrant, so I'm a little bit unclear what's going on. Might just yeah. be out right. Just thinking in the beginning of my PhD, I did another project where we tried to we tried to do overexpression of intuin alpha eleven, but those were in primary fibroblasts. So we did manage to do um, some TFM measurements, but not enough. But I think that that was mostly just because we had so much problems with just overexpressing the construct in primary cells. So yeah. And I think there's they're just more finicky with the alpha and beta subunits. Like you have to make sure the stoichiometry is right and they're localizing right. I think you can. There's a yeah. lot that can go wrong. That, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, since it's 11 o'clock, I think that we can start. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Martina Lechia. I'm a postdoc in Claire Waterman's lab. And Ankita mentioned last week that I will help out her and Jennifer every now and then if one of them would be out and unavailable for, to join the meeting. And today, both of them are actually out. So please bear with me. Uh, I will host this seminar for the first time and hopefully everything will go fine. And as per usual, please feel free to write questions in the chat box during the seminar. Or then you can just raise your hand if you want to ask the question in person, but that will be after presentation. And now for the exciting part. Today we have Patrick Ose joining us. Uh, he did his PhD at Brown University with Jay Tang, looking at liquid crystalline phase transitions of actin solutions. And after that, he moved to Margaret Gardell's lab at the University of Chicago for a postdoc, where he worked on a broad array of projects connected to mechanosensing and force generation. In 2016, he started his own lab at the University of Rochester, and in 2019, he moved to Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine, where he's currently an associate professor in the Department of Cell and Molecular Physiology. His lab is studying all things related to mechanosensing and mechanotransduction, and today we will hear about mechanics of key cell migration. Patrick, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Martina. Um, and also thank you to Jen and Ankita, obviously, for the invitation. Um, and so I just wanted to start basically with a, you know, a broad overview of what my lab is actually interested in. And so as Martina mentioned, we're really, we're uh, interested in anything that kind of connects mechanics and biology. And so by mechanics, we think about things that are happening both at the protein level and the organelle level, and also at the cellular scale. And that obviously entails thinking about the components that make up these structures, right? So individual proteins like myosin motors and full cohesion complex proteins, um, but also the larger structures of the actin cytoskeleton and the stress fibers and things that they form. And the question that we're really most intrigued by is how these two are coupled. So how do the individual proteins interact with and influence the mechanics of the system? And how do mechanics actually interact and influence the interactions of these different biochemical um, uh, interactions? And so the, the most obvious example of this is migration, right? So migration is a, is a complex process that's a coupling of a variety of biochemical interactions along with the mechanical interactions that allow a cell to translocate and move, right? And so what I'm showing you here is on the, the bottom left is a picture of a, a fibroblast expressing zixin, and on the right is this traction force map showing where the forces are being generated by the cell as it migrates. So as I started to think about what I wanted to talk about in this, uh, this seminar today, um, it was really struggling to come up with exactly the right topic because we'd have a bunch of stuff that recently came out. And so I obviously chose to talk about T cells, but I just briefly wanted to mention two other really exciting stories that we just have put up on, as preprints in the last month or so um, that you should go and check out. So one is about um, myosin two filaments that are actually processive. So this is an awesome collaboration with Eric Vitriol down in Augusta Medical College in Georgia. Um, and Jordan Beach here at Loyola. And you can see even just from this movie, we see crazy myosin movements that are anterograde and against the, the direction that you'd normally see. So this is up in BioArchive and you should go check out, there's lots of fun movies. The other thing that we just put out recently was a collaboration with Vincenzo Ventelli and Margaret Gardella at University of Chicago. Um, and this is more physics -y to try to think about how we could use machine learning to develop uh, models of living systems. Um, this is a super exciting story. It's way complex and dense to get into right now, but uh, it's up in archive. You can check it out. There's all sorts of information there. And if you have any questions about these, please just reach out um, and I'd be happy to talk more about. Okay, but today's topic, we're gonna talk about T cells and migration. And so I think it would come as no surprise to this particular group of people um, that mechanics can really influence the way cells interact with their environment. And so what I'm showing you here is just a fibroblast plated on substrates of different stiffness. So these are all coated um, polychromide gels with fibronectin. And you can see here from 200 uh, pascals up to you know, gigapascals on a glass, the cells just look different, right? They, they change their morphology, they change their internal architectures of the actin stress fiber. Um, and they're clearly responding to the fact that the substrate itself is stiffer or, or more compliant. 
And so uh, a couple months ago, um, Jen actually asked on Twitter some of people's favorites uh, original cell migration papers related to mechanics. And this was one of mine. This is a, a paper from Yuli Wong's lab that showed a cell migrating from a stiff to a soft substrate. And when they hit this boundary, the cell decides to turn and stay on the stiffer side. Right? And so we know that these, these signals are getting incorporated and processed in real time as the cell interacts with its, um, its extracellular environment. So we also know that the, the shape of that environment really influences how cells um, behave and, and um, exhibit their, their different uh, phenotypes. So here's a, just, again, a traditional fire blast. If I showed this to any of you, you'd all say that this probably looks exactly what you'd expect a fire blast to look like. There's clear actin stress fibers. There's nice little podia. It's changing shape and slowly kind of moving around the cover stuff. However, if we take that exact same fire blast and now we put it under confinement, now we see this crazy leader bleb formation kind of thing where there's a massive lamellopodia dragging behind um, a uropod behind it. So this is things that Ankita has, has told us a lot about in this seminar series, right? And so again, I really wanna stress that this is the exact same cell, right? From the same dish, just put in two different physical environments and they have very, very drastic um, responses to how they're gonna interact with that environment. And so this is not just a, a, a purview of, of fire blast or mesenchymal cells. Um, immune cells also do the exact same thing. So this is actually one of the first projects that got me um, excited about transitioning kind of from a more physics-y approach to a, a more biological world. Um, and this is human uh, primary neutrophils that are being attracted towards a, a gradient of FMLP um, coming out of this little micro pipette tip in the center. And so this is on a soft substrate and you can see that they all kind of get to that pipette tip, but they're kind of rounded up and they're very dynamic and they move around. However, if we look at the exact same situation, but now on a stiff substrate, what you see is that, again, qualitatively, it's immediately apparent that these cells look different, right? These are the exact same human neutrophils um, migrating to the exact same chemotractin. Everything is the exact same except for the stiffness or the compliance of that substrate. And so in this case, on the stiff substrate, they, they flatten out like pancakes and they form what almost look like a more canonical um, mesenchymal or keratinocyte maybe migration strategy. And so migration is a fundamental component of any kind of immune response, right? And so here's a beautiful in vivo movie from Tim Lauerman showing um, this was a laser induced damage and you see all these neutrophils swarming to the site of the, the damage, right? And so our immune system is relying upon the idea that they can get the cells that need to either respond or kill off infections or fight back um, infections or to change, you know, inflammatory signaling and all that kind of stuff. But they have to get from point A to point B, right? You can't have a functioning immune response without migration. And, you know, what's really fascinating about this is they have to move through a variety of different environments um, and, and compositions of, of different proteins and signaling to actually get to these different places, right? So like you might be inside the lymph node where you have to interact within the lymph node in various places, then you exit into the bloodstream, and then you have to extravasate from the bloodstream into the tissue to fight um, whatever signal that you're getting there, right? And so I kind of like these two cartoons on the right here that really describe this idea of how you know, these uh, immune cells are really experiencing a large variety of different um, environments, both biochemically and physically, all the time, right? And so they're constantly moving back and forth, these things, and they have to get from one to the other side. And so if you were to think about a cell that might be uh, really good at being aware of mechanical changes and responding to them, immune cells would seem like prime candidates to try to explore, right? And so if we think about this immune system, it's incredibly diverse in terms of, of mechanical um, stimuli and that we have different uh, organs, we have different tissues, we have different um, uh, lymphatic systems and all these other things. And so if we think about just from a mechanical perspective, right, stiffness, these cells might experience everything from, you know, a pure viscous fluid, so in the bloodstream, all the way up to something incredibly stiff near bone, right? And so that can span, you know, five, six orders of magnitude in terms of, of stiffness. Um, and then also we have to think about the fact that they experience a wide variety of compositions. So we often see these beautiful movies in vivo and we see the collagen fibers in an individual cell, right? And so that would be this panel A here in the bottom left. But really you have multiple types of ECM, right? You have fibronectin and collagen potentially. You also have all sorts of biochemical signaling. You might have chemokines that have been deposited in, and um, also around the contrived migration. And then also you have tons of other cells. These are complex, dense environments. These aren't just flat cover slips that, that these cells are kind of migrating on. And so really immune cells should be primed to, to have lots of different migration modes and to be really excellent at uh, navigating these different complex environments. Okay. So let's take a step back and think about what we know in terms of mesenchymal migration, right? And so mesenchymal migration is, is really how we've learned the most about migration. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The most obvious is that it's the most amenable to beautiful microscopy, right? We can put down a fire blast on a flat cover slip. They're, they're mostly flat themselves, except for the part that extends over the nucleus. 
Um, and then they're, they're not very fast, right? They're pretty slow and they form these large stable structures, which means that we can image them in, in high resolution and high detail uh, without necessarily having them change rapidly over time. Um, and so we know a lot about migration. We know that it's lipodial driven, which is actin-based protrusion that's driven uh, pushing out the leading membrane. We know that there's adhesions that form in the substrate and we know exactly what's in the vast majority of these adhesions, right? There's been these beautiful works that have done these ultra structure studies to show exactly where um, different proteins align within these structures. In contrast, amoeboid migration is a much less understood kind of area, right? So this is from the same review. I'm looking now at what we call amoeboid migration, it's much, much faster, right? It's orders of magnitude faster, actually. Um, and then the thing that always kind of stuck out to me is that this idea that it's kind of unclear how, um, how the, the cell is interacting with its substrate, right? And this is most typically associated with things like um, immune cells, which is where we're going we're gonna to talk about this today. Okay, so one of the reasons that I think that this has been so fascinating is that there was a seminal paper that came out of Michael Six lab um, uh, about, was it 2009, I believe, uh, that showed that if he took dendritic cells and he knocked out all the integrants and he, or he knocked out tailin, which is the adapter protein just on the other side of the membrane from the integrants, um, that the cells couldn't migrate in 2D, right? And so he showed very nicely that when you got rid of them, they didn't really migrate in 2D and they just kind of sat there. However, when you took these exact same cells and put them in a 3D um, environment, specifically a collagen kind of matrix, um, he could get them to migrate incredibly well and they could still respond to chemotaxis, right? And so this really suggested that there were these alternative mechanisms and modes that these cells might use in, um, in different environments to navigate. And then interestingly, a couple of years ago, um, we had a collaborator, Deborah Fowler, at, um, she was at Rochester at the time, she's currently at Cornell, that showed us this beautiful movie of Th2 cells. So this is a, a, a factor T cell. Um, and uh, collagen harmonics in blue. And what she did was she injected integrin blocking antibodies into an inflamed mouse ear. And what you'll see is that they all of a sudden they just stop, right? So they go into they go this really drastic phenotype of migrating, they're very happy, they're moving around. You add in the integrin blocking antibodies and then all of a sudden they come to a stop, right? And so this suggests that there might be something that they're actually doing with these integrins that is allowing them to migrate in these kind of environments. Okay, so if we think about what the mechanics of migration actually mean, right? I like to think about it in terms of this phase space and there's some kind of uh, uh, combination of force generation and adhesion that you need to move. So obviously if you don't have any force generation and you have no adhesion, then most likely you're not gonna be motile. You're just gonna kind of sit there and just kind of not do anything. If you have too much adhesion, you're also gonna be not motile. And so the, the analogy I always make with this is to think of like fly paper, right? The fly gets stuck to the paper, it's so sticky that it can't actually leave because it's, it's anchored in one place. Similarly, if you've ever been in a snowstorm in New England or anywhere else where there's tons of snow, if you get in a car in a snowbank and you spin your tires, you're trying to generate lots of force, but you don't actually get any adhesion. And so you get this slipping phenotype where you're generating lots of force, but you're not actually moving, right? And so again, that's not productive migration. And so really to have productive migration, you need some kind of balance of adhesion and force generation. And that allows you to, to, to move um, in these different environments. Okay, so for this particular project, we decided that we wanted to look at immune cells and that we wanted to pick a subset um, to, to really focus on because to, um, to drive on this question of how they're interacting with their substrates. And so the ones we chose were to look at um, Th1 cells, which are a subset of CD4 positive T cells. And so in this case, you have naive T cells that have been activated by a DC and they turn into these effector T cells that then leave the lymph node and go out into the tissue to fight off um, whatever they're, they're responding to. And the reason that we chose this was because um, our collaborator Deb Fowl had showed that if, when you move from the naive state to the Th1 or Th2 um, subset of these cells, they actually upregulate integrin alpha V and integrin beta three, right? And so what this tells us is that they're gonna have the, the right machinery to be able to interact with fibronectin specifically, right? And so if we go back to this uh, beautiful chart that I think anyone who does anything with integrins probably has taped to their wall somewhere to remind us, um, you know, we have a variety of alpha and beta subunits that can then bind different ligands. And so in this case, they already have this alpha L beta two. So this is gonna be the integrin that allows them to bind to things like ICAM. Um, and now in this effector subset, they're now upregulating alpha V beta three, which is gonna be the RGD receptors or fibronectin. And so the question we really asked is gonna be something simple. And that's to say, if they have these integrins, do they use them to actually migrate through these complex environments, right? Are they doing all the things that we just see associated with mesenchymal cells, but are they just doing it in this kind of um, immune cell context? Okay, so the very first thing we did was we just took our cells, and these are primary Th1 cells, and we put them on a glass cover slip coated with ICAM, right? And so this is going to be the ligand for alpha L beta 2. 
And so you do this and they migrate like gangbusters, right? They, they adhere really well and they move really fast. You can track them and they're moving hundreds of microns over 20 or so minutes. So they're doing all the things that you would canonically expect um, a, a you know, cell to do in this kind of context. If we take the exact same situation and now we put them on fibronectin, so this is the alpha V beta three ligand, right? What you'll see is that it actually looks more like Brownian motion. And that's because they're not actually interacting with the substrate very long. And so if you do the tracking, what you get, you get these kind of jiggly paths that are all related to just floating around and not actually binding to the substrate strongly. So to show you that they are actually interacting with the substrate transiently, I'm gonna show you uh, this beautiful movie that's uh, combining the exact same setup we just had, but now with a micro pattern where we have strips of fibronectin. So that's a kind of in this bullseye shape, these circular stripes. And then in between is this passivated region which the cell shouldn't be able to bind to anything, right? So it should be blocked and not be able to interact with something. And as this plays, hopefully what you can see is that there's movement from the fact that we're doing multiple stage positions. So we're kind of moving the fluid around inside the, the chamber. Um, and you see this flowing of material or cells from left to right. And when they hit these, uh, these fibronectin patches, they often stop and slow down for a second and then they move on again, right? And so this is telling us that there are some transient interactions that are happening between the cell and the fibronectin. It's just not enough to keep them uh, down and migrating for an incredibly long time. So just to kind of show this even in greater detail, we can do it at a much higher density. And you can see when we play this movie that you actually can see the rings of where the fibronectin is just from the fact that all the cells are kind of clustering and, and lumping up in this kind of spot, right? And so if you think about this in terms of just kind of kinetics, what this is telling us is that on this kind of bare glass interface, or sorry, 2D glass interface, ICAM is doing an incredible job of binding to the substrate and it's keeping the cell um, held down there. And so there's a really good on rate, but maybe they're not letting go as often with the LFA1. However, the fibronectin, there seems to be a much more kind of equilibrium between both on and off rate. And so these cells aren't spending a lot of time actually pressed down against the surface, but they are interacting transiently with this, this ligand, right? Which means that they should be able to use it productively to, to actually migrate. Okay. so. The thought then was, well, maybe if we could make them interact with the substrate more often, then they would migrate better, right? And so we turned to Matthew Piel, and he helped us set up this um, cell migration confiner system that he's built in the past, which is essentially these little micro pillars of PDMS. And you squash down the cell about five microns as a gap, and then they can migrate in between. So again, we have our primary TH1s. There's no chemokine here. We're just tracking the cells using a nuclear stain. Um, and on ICAM, they still migrate like gangbusters, right? And so again, we see the exact same thing we saw before, tons of migration. Now, if we do the same thing, but with the fibronectin coated, we see that they also suddenly begin to migrate incredibly well, right? And so all we've done here is we've just confined the cells. So it's the exact same situation we had before, but we've now just put them in um, a surface that keeps them within five microns of the, the cell. And you can actually see in the bottom of it, that pillar is where we've actually squashed a bunch of cells as we went into confine them. And that's why they're all flattened out and then kind of dead in the corner. But they're migrating incredibly fast and, and basically the equivalent to what we see on ICAM, but now they're just on fibronectin. Right, and so we can do some measurements of various uh, characteristics of migration. What we can see is that they're a little bit slower, but they end up migrating roughly the same amount of distance. And if we repeat the exact same measure, but do it just with a purely passivated surface, we see that they don't migrate as well, either as fast or as far. And if we do another non-specific binding interaction, so in this case, we do PLL, which is gonna be a more electrostatic mediated interaction. We again see that they don't migrate as fast or as far as, as they do when they have um, either fibronectin or ICAM present, right? And so that really is telling you that they, they're, they're using this ECM to, to actually help them be migratory. And that actually fits with some work we had done previously um, showing that if we block the fibronectin ligand, um, we also see a change in migration. So this is again with TH1 cells. Um, in this case, we're using two different peptides. The, uh, the 311C is gonna be just a control one. And this PUR4 actually binds the, the RGD site on fibronectin. So it would, should basically block it when we, um, when we pre-treat the fibronectin. And what you can see is that these cells, when they're migrating, they, they migrate very well um, under confinement in the control peptide case, but in the, the treatment with the blocking peptide, um, they no longer really migrate that well, right? And so this is telling you that there is most likely some actual interaction between these two sets of, 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 of components, the ECM and the, the integrin lag. Okay, so then we started to think about, well, you know, how much ECM do you actually need? And we started to remember that, you know, when you add FBS to your media, right, that you often have some ECM present in the, the FBS, right? And so even if you don't add any extra um, exogenously, you still have some present. 
So here I'm showing you a movie on the left of a passivated surface. So again, this is something where there should be no specific interaction between the ligands, uh, the integrins and any kind of ligand and the presence of FBS and they migrate quite well, right? You can see all sorts of tracks and they're moving around. If I add in fibronectin now to my surface instead of passivating it, you again see that they migrate incredibly well. But then here's the fun one. If I look at a passivated surface, but take out the FBS, they don't migrate at all, right? And so the movie's playing, there's only just a couple cells that are actually being able to move, right? So even just that tiny bit of ECM that's present in the FBS seems to be enough to get it to, to be able to migrate, right? And then if we add back in our, uh, our ECM, in this case, fibronectin, without FBS present now, then we totally recover our migration again. So again, in this case, there's no FBS, they're under confinement, and we've coated the surface with fibronectin and they migrate again like gangbusters, right? So they, they clearly are, are able to use this ECM to migrate. And if we go back and we look at the displacement, we can see that on the, uh, the PLL on the passivated surface, we, and we don't really see any kind of actual movement. ICAM, we obviously see really great motion and then we can titrate in the amount of fibronectin that we add and we can kind of dose this response. And the same thing with the velocity, we see this kind of slow increase. And so just to kind of uh, show you exactly what's going on to convince you that they are trying to move. This isn't that the cells are dead or lack the impetus to move. Um, they're jiggling around. They just don't actually get very far, right? And so they're just kind of stuck in place and they're, they're trying their hardest to get some of it can't move. However, when we compare this with the, the fibronectin coded without the FBS, now what we see is that they, again, they migrate incredibly well and they're moving just like they would um, in other kinds of cases. So it really seems to be that the trigger here is this ability to have the, uh, the fibronectin available and present. And then uh, presumably that means that they're interacting with the, the integrin ligand and using it to, to migrate. So this is just a, a compilation of the data, data I just showed you, but to really highlight this difference between FBS and no FBS. Um, so on the left is showing the paired kind of results and on the right are just the bar graphs. And if we look, we can really see that um, in all cases, except for when we have ICAM really, and the, the large amount of fibronectin, you take away the FBS has a dramatic impact on the migration um, velocity. And it really um, drops it down to basically noise levels of not moving very far. And that's true for the displacement as well. And so once you have a sufficient amount of fibronectin or if you have ICAM present, then having FBS doesn't really make a difference in terms of your migration speed. Um, but it, it's really when you have less than that, that it does does make this kind of um, strong, um, strong effect. Okay, so hopefully what I've convinced you is that in the presence of, of fibronectin, these cells migrate really well, and that that fibronectin is what actually allows them to migrate. When you take it away, they disappear, and when uh, they don't migrate as well, and when you add it back in, you can recover all this migration. So the next question then is really, okay, well, are they forming focal adhesions, right? So I just told you we had the ligand that was necessary, but now we need to look inside the cell and try to see if the integrins are actually present um, and the other uh, focal adhesion proteins are, are there to make these focal adhesion structures. So as I said, um, focal adhesions are these incredibly well-structured um, proteins that have been analyzed and, and really broken down in great detail. They consist of over 150 different proteins. Um, and so we're obviously not gonna look at every single one of them. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of the major players that are kind of known as canonical signaling um, proteins inside focal adhesions. And that's basically talin and vinculin, right? And so talin is, is one of the early proteins that gets recruited to help cluster initial integrins. Um, and vinculin is one of the one adapter proteins that binds to both talin and actin and kind of acts as a, a bridge or a scaffold between a lot of these other structures. Okay, so again, I'm showing you here, this is in confined um, setups. Here's ICAM, um, and we this is an overexpression of an EGFP vinculin construct. And what you can see is that you see lots of these little dark plaques that are consistent with this idea of a focal adhesion, um, right? And so they're all localizing and they're just, they're turning over very rapidly. This is a 20 minute movie, um, but they're there and they're present. And they, they, they do all the things that you would expect. Similarly, if we look at a fibronectin movie, um, we see the exact same thing. So these are also, I should mention again, these are primary TH1 T cells. Um, you know, and so we see the exact same kind of structures and we see all these things that you would associate with um, focal adhesions. If we then switch and we put it on a PLL peg, which again is this idea of a more friction mediated um, interaction or non-specific interaction, um, we don't actually see any of these big structures anymore. You can see some of these kind of dark puncta, um, but they're not actually stationary with respect to the surface. And we think they're just uh, vesicles that have been um, endocytosed and they're floating around inside the cytoplasm. 
Um, and then if we switch again and we do PLL, um, again, so this is all integrant independent migration on this bottom row. Um, this is now electrostatic mediated. We don't see any of these kind of um, puncta or, or structures kind of form. So it really looks to see that you enrich these structures in vinculin when you have uh, the ligand present for either ICAM or fibronectin. We can do a similar thing with tailin. Um, so this is the exact same setup. Here's ICAM with tailin. We can see these kind of structures in the back um, where they're forming these kind of things. We see the exact same ones in fibronectin again. Um, and again, when we switch to PLL um, PEG or PLL, so this passivated surface or this electrostatic interaction, uh, we see the exact same thing that we don't see any of these kind of puncta anymore. Um, and we don't see any of these kind of structures really form. So it really seems to be uh, ligand dependent. And whether you have either ICAM or fibronectin, you still build these kind of adapter proteins and then structures for focal pieces. Okay, so why might we see these different kind of structures, right? So if we think about what we know from mesenchymal migration, um, I'm showing you on the left here at fibroblast again, you see these big fat stress fibers, right? And they're turning over really slowly. If we look at what we see in the same kind of life act probe, but now in these TH1 cells, what we see is a complete absence of those structures. We don't see any of the big stress fibers or any of the other kind of things. We see instead these kind of dense networks at the front, which are presumably ARP23 driven uh, lamellopodial-like structures. And so if, you know, a couple of years ago, we had shown that um, part of the maturation process was, uh, was regulated by the ability to form these kind of stress fibers and that that didn't have any impact on the ability of the, the focal lesions to transmit forces, but to kind of grow these large plaques, the focal lesions would mature basically along the, the direction of these stress fibers. And so you can actually see this just if this movie of a fire blast with Paxillin, you could almost draw where the stress fibers are because the, the you know, the, um, the ellipticity of the adhesion kind of tells the direction of that fiber. And you can even see some little fibers here along the back end um, at the end of this kind of movie. But if we look at the, um, the amoeboid kind of uh, TH1 cells, what we see is we don't see any of those kind of structures. And instead, instead of being all at the periphery, we tend to see them more centrally located inside the, um, the cell as it's migrating. Sometimes with stationary cells, you do see it more at the edge, but for, uh, for the most part, we really see them more centrally located. Um, and this is kind of shown better here. We see that, you know, we, this accumulation of these vinculin kind of puncta mostly in the center cell, sometimes at the uropod the leading edge. Um, and if you look at the DIC, what I think you should hopefully see here is that the cell isn't very flat. So if we look compared to fiberglass, we have that very nice planar kind of surface where everything is. And if we think back to what Alba showed us last week, these immune cells send up protrusions in every single kind of direction, right? And so they've got these massive melopodia that are coming up from everywhere. And it's really the center part of it that tends to most often be anchored in that one spot. And so that's why we think that we're seeing um, the focal adhesions really form in those areas um, compared to other ones. And so just to kind of prove to you that we think that these are actually focal adhesions on both sides, uh, we did some Z stacks and we, we imaged the vinculin again. And so the magenta ones are on the top surface and the green ones are on the bottom surface. And so you can really see that they're forming adhesions on both the top and the bottom layer of these kind of confinement systems, um, but that they're more kind of centrally located as they send out these big protrusions in other kinds of directions, right? So I'll just let this loop through just so that it's pretty obvious that we have it on both surfaces. All right, so at this point, we felt confident that these are actually forming adhesions, but we just wanted to, to convince ourselves a little bit further. So we went back to our micro pattern assay. And so here we have a, a TH1 cell that's expressing an EGFP um, beta-3 integrin. And so it's going to migrate from the passivated region to the fibronectin region. And hopefully what you'll see as it crosses over this boundary is it starts to leave these retraction fibers, right? And so it's pretty clear that there's some kind of interaction that's uh, more specific with that surface. And as the cell pulls away from it, there's little pieces of itself that are basically getting left behind, right? And we only see these on the fibronectin coated regions. And then once it hops off into the passivated region, um, first of all, it tends to try to go back to the fibronectin region, but we don't see any of these kind of retraction fibers. We can do the exact same thing with the other proteins. So in this case, it's tailin. Um, so fibronectin is on the top left and passivated surface on the, on the bottom right. And so we can see these kind of puncta. And then once it crosses over, you know, we're in the exact same focal plane, but we lose a lot of those structures and these kind of um, uh, aggregates of the, the protein, right? And so we can look at individual frames and we can see this kind of accumulation of these proteins. Similarly, we can do the exact same thing with vinculin now. Um, and so we can see that we see on the fibronectin pattern, we see these kind of puncta form, and then they disappear once they go off into this passivated region and they, they tend to try to come back. So all the signs here are pointing to the fact that they not only require ECM to actually get moving, but when the ECM is there, they, um, they 
form these kind of structures that have, you know, both the tail end, the integrins, and the vinculins all in them, right? And so they're all basically behaving so far as everything that you would expect from a focal adhesion. Okay, so the next question then is the, the next obvious one really, is that if they're forming these structures and they're using integrins to bind to the ECM, are they actually generating forces at those spots? And are they transmitting forces at those spots um, to, to help them migrate? And so to this, we turn to a technique that we've been doing for years now, um, which is traction force microscopy. And so just in case you're not familiar with it, I'm gonna walk through a cartoon real briefly. The idea behind it is that instead of putting a cell on a, a stiff glass substrate, you put them on these polycolomide gels that you can coat with whatever ECM protein you want. And you fill that polycolomide gel with a bunch of fluorescent beads. And so in this case, you might have some kind of fluorescent stain that tells you where your cell is, that's in this case, actin. And we have this, um, these beads that we can image. And so this is showing you both an image of the cell pulling on the gel, that's the cell on image. And when we've taken the cell off, so we've used a detergent to, re to, to permeabilize it and get rid of it, and the gel relaxes. And you can see there's this translocation of it, right? And so that translocation, you can do some math and basically solve for the displacement and the forces that are there. And you can calculate how much force is being applied by these things. And so the math can get complicated and you don't need to focus on that. You can think back to your introductory physics class. This is basically F equals KX. The force is equal to the stiffness of the substrate times the displacement that substrate moves. We're just doing that in two dimensions, right? Okay. This is how we typically do all our fiberglass imaging. So you saw in the very beginning, I showed you a nice movie of a, a fiberglass with Zixon migrating. Um, in order for to do this with the, um, our immune cells, however, we have to be a little bit trickier, right? We just showed you that you need to have some kind of confinement in order to get them to interact with the substrate consistently. And so we did two kind of methods to kind of get at this. We either coated them with an agarose gel that helped kind of keep them on that surface, or we actually took a second gel and just inverted it and kind of sandwiched them between two polycrylamide gels. Um, and then we can do the same kind of uh, measurements in each kind of plane, right? And in each case, we can coat them with whatever uh, ECM protein that we really want. Okay, so here's a, a primary Th1 T cell expressing life acts. You can kind of see where it is and the, the traction forces are on the right. Um, and I'm just gonna play this movie. And what you can see is that it's forming these kind of hot spots and where it's pulling. Um, and you can see the general outline. Um, and you can see that all the forces within the outline are basically pulling inwards, right? Which is exactly what you'd expect for a cell that's generating internal cytoskeleton contraction and pulling on it, right? All those forces should be directed from the cell periphery towards the cell center of the body. You can see lots of other cells in this movie that aren't transfected. That's why there's these kind of hot spots that come out in other kinds of ways. So that's completely expected. We don't get 100% transfection with our primary cells. Um, but one of the other things that I'd like to point out is the scale bar on the right, right? So with the fibroblasts, we typically see stresses that are in the kilopascals, right? So that's thousands of pascals. Here, we're seeing stresses that are on the order of 20 to 30 pascals. So these are incredibly weak. And they have, to enable to do this measurements, you have to make these gels incredibly soft, right? So there's certainly a regime where they, they work best in this, but they're doing all the normal things that you would expect with kind of typical focal lesions and generating forces. And so we can do this again, where we look at both the top and the bottom surface. So now we have gels on both the bottom and the top. And so I'm showing you on the left here, the beads, um, and then vinculin is gonna be in, in magenta, and then the traction movies in the middle. And so you can kind of see that the cell is pushing its way through this gel, pulling on it and migrating around. And so again, the forces here are incredibly weak, but they're all pointed in the right direction. And so we see when we have these accumulations of vinculin hotspots, that's also where we see the exact same forces that are being pulled inward, right? So again, this fits into our idea of exactly what these things are doing. They're focal adhesions in both structure and in function at this point. They have all the right components, they're generating forces, or they're transmitting forces, sorry, that are generated in the cytoskeleton, and they're being transmitted to the substrate through these specific spots. If we look at the top of the gel, um, we can see the same kind of thing. You can see little hot spots of vinculin in various places, and now you can see in gel. But you might see in this one that there's actually an outline kind of around the, the cell. Um, so you can almost make out the, the shape of it in the traction force map. And if you go through and you actually look, what you see is that there are regions where they're being pulled inward, and they're, um, those co-localized where we see vinculin. But you also see a bunch of regions where the cell is actually uh, pushing the gel out of the way outward, like away from the body, right? And so these tend to be much weaker than the, the, the vinculin associated spots where we see pulling, but they definitely exist and they're, and they're always directed outward from the cell, right? And so we, um, Alexia Kaye, the postdoc in my lab who's been doing all this work, we talked a lot about the best way to kind of explain this. 
Um, and what we think is really going on is that as the cell is pulling itself through the CCM, it's actually pushing the ECM out of the way. And the easiest analogy we could come up with is to put a cat under a blanket. And when they migrate, right, they're pulling themselves through the, the blanket and they're pushing it out of the way. And then they suddenly emerge, right? And so the, the pushing is not a direct function of, of the cat actually taking its paws and pushing out. He's using his paws just like normal focal adhesions would be used to pull. But the, the ECM is being displaced by his steric hindrance of, the, of this body pushing through the system, right? And so we think that's exactly what the, the, the T cells are doing here. Right. And so if you look at the bottom gel, we can see that we have on the top gel, we see these spots where we have these integrin dependent forces. And these are always uh, pointed inwards, which is exactly what we'd expect with kind of focal adhesions and cytoskeleton mediated traction stresses. But at the same time, we have these integrin independent forces that are really from uh, the cell body pushing itself through that gel um, and displacing it. Right. OK, so now the question is, do cells actually need this ECM to migrate? Right? And so we went back to thinking about um, some of our earlier confinement assays. And what we had told you was that if we took out the, the ECM and then we took out the, um, the FBS, then they really didn't migrate. And then we could recover it um, with the presence of FBS or by adding in more, um, more uh, ligand, like ECM. Right? But then we also showed that on the passivated surfaces, with the presence of FBS, they would migrate. Right? And that we could get this kind of thing. And so here, the nice thing about the polyacrylamide gel is that it's actually a perfect passivated surface. Whenever we try to passivate glass, you never do it perfectly. You always leave a little bit of space behind where things can stick down and do other stuff. But for polyacrylamide, cells have no ligand to it, right? So here we can really control what happens when we, we put a ligand on the surface. And so here we have ICAM on the left, and these are color-coded velocities, so you can kind of get an idea of how well they're migrating. And so they migrate really well when they're um, on this kind of, um, this ECM. We can do a similar thing with fibronectin, and we can see again that they migrate incredibly well and they're moving around. And it's not every single cell, um, right? But the vast majority of them are actually migrating. However, if we take the exact same setup and we don't coat them, so this is just a bare polyacrylamide gel now. Again, this is a movie that's playing and what you should hopefully see is that there's almost no migration, right? So that really is this lack of ECM doesn't allow them to try to move through these more complex environments where they're being squished and, and kind of controlled together. Right, and so we can go back and we can now measure it. And so now the, the effects get even more dramatic, basically. Right, so when we don't have any ECM present, there's really almost no displacement and there's no effective velocity. Um, and then when we add in fibronectin or ICAM on the surface, then they start to migrate very robustly and they can move through these more complex environments. And I think this really kind of shows what's going on. So this is a cell that's then sandwiched between um, these two gels. And I'm showing you the transverse views. Uh, so those are the yellow lines. We're looking at the two movies on the side um, on the bottom. And what you can see is that when the movie starts and the cell is right in between those two gels, you can actually see a gap between those gels. And as the cell migrates away, that gap actually disappears and the gel comes back down. So in this case, the, the cell has to be strong enough to actually separate those two surfaces and squeeze between them and pull itself through, right? And then once it actually gets far enough away, then the, the gel relaxes back um, and it gets confined again. And so we think that this is exactly what's happening um, inside of the, the cells. And so this is, uh, again, from our, our collaboration with Deb Foles lab. Um, we have here that fibronectin is, is labeled in green, and these are primary Th1 cells inside of an inflamed mouse dermis. And I just want you to look at this region where there's this T cell migrating through this uh, hunk of collagen. And you can see that as it kind of squeezes between these different collagen fibrils, it actually deforms them and pushes them out of the way quite a lot. Right? And so we think that this is analogous to exactly what we're seeing inside these systems here, is that as the cell gets pulled through these things, it actually just kind of moves some of this stuff out of the way. And so it's not a, a specific pushing force, it's more of a steric hindrance, the, the cell getting dragged through it that causes this kind of pushing force. And the pulling force is all coming from these, uh, these integrin based things. And so you can actually see this if you, um, you take a similar setup with the two polyacrylamide gels, and now we, we put a bunch of glass beads in between the two layers. And so the idea here was to try to create some of that space um, to kind of give them ways that they could migrate through. But then we saw something even cooler is that as the cell migrates, it actually pushes these glass beads out of the way, right? And so you can see they're very stationary until a cell comes by. Um, there's again, a couple cells that aren't as transfected as well. Um, but if you watch these kind of uh, these regions, as the cell migrates through, it's literally just grabbing hold of them and pushing them out of the way, right? And so this is, we think the same kind of thing that you're seeing with the cat under the bed or the cells migrating between these two confined kind of surfaces.
Okay, so then we started to look at, well, maybe, you know, how does this actually work and, and what's going on in these contexts? And we, we noticed a couple really interesting phenomena. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this movie right here of cells as they migrate, they tend to follow the same paths and they, they take the path and they extend it a little bit further every time. So you see the cell in the middle here, it's kind of migrating at this green speed and it pushes it out each time it goes back and forth. And then as it migrates along the same path, it speeds up, right? And so they're using these kind of these architectures and these pathways to then uh, to, to make the environment more favorable for migration further on. And so we can also see that if we look at individual cells, they'll often follow along the exact same path as a previous cell. Right. And so that really suggests that there's somehow the T cells are interacting with their environment in such a way that it's allowing them to, to uh, you know, guide other cells and to follow along. And so we don't really know exactly what that could be. You could imagine that could be a biochemical footprint, like, right, it's leaving behind some pieces of membrane or a chemokine or something else that allows its neighbor to say this is the best way forward. So some kind of proverbial breadcrumb trail. Um, it could also be that it's actually deforming the, the, the path in such a way that it makes it more uh, favorable for cells to migrate through, right? It's done the, the heavy work of clearing the path and then someone else gets to just follow along afterward. Uh, but we think it's a really interesting feature of these kind of things. And, and it makes sense that as an immune cell, you don't want to have to kind of bushwhack your way through each time, right? Like you would prefer to have someone else clear the way and follow along a much easier track. It's a, track. It's a much more efficient uh, mechanism of migration. So we don't necessarily know exactly what's going on here, um, but we're really excited to, to keep playing with it and try to figure it out because we think it's a, a part of the what's driving the efficiency of this migration. Okay, so to, to kind of bring this all together into a, a kind of a more complete story, right? What I really want to, to, to leave you with is this idea is that the immune system is an incredibly complex system, right? There's tons of different environments, both biochemically and physically that cells have to get through. And so once they exit out of that, you know, they have to go through tissue. And so when they get there, they're going to encounter these ECM proteins, right? And especially these effector T cells that have these upregulated alpha V beta 3 integrants, they're going to find it and they're going to build these focal adhesions to pull on this ECM. And that's going to allow them to translocate and generate these forces. And that the, the pushing and the deformation of things around them is really this result of this, you know, pulling your body through a tight space and the steric hindrance that's, that's um, you know, resisting your movement through it. And so as you squeeze through, you kind of push through and make it go on. Right. And so we think that these T cells are basically, even though they're using this amoeboid migration, they're actually migrating in very similar forms to mesenchymal cells. Right. And so just to kind of revisit this idea of mesenchymal versus amoeboid migration, um, if we look at the left, we have our fibroblasts and at the right, we have our, our immune cells and we can see their different time scales. And on the left, the mesenchymal ones, it's really a function of the fact that they're slow. You have the adhesions are bigger and less dynamic. So there's less turnover and you have more of ability to, to accumulate these plaques and these structures. Um, and you don't get this turnover and change of direction. And the fact that they're really flat. Right, so much of the protrusion is happening only at the very little couple microns of the, the melopodia at the leading edge. The rest of it is pretty much all planar and staying where it is. And then in the mutant cells, what we really see, the adhesions are much, much more small. Um, they're more dynamic. And the confinement is really a, a way to allow more interaction between those integrins and the substrates. So because they're, they're not as, um, the affinity is not as high, they're not going to be enough and sufficient to allow the cell to bind to the surface on its own. And so by confining it, what you're doing is you're basically increasing those, that rate of contact between the integrins and the surrounding area. And that allows them to build these uh, structures and to migrate successfully and everything else. But in both cases, what they're doing, these structures are coupling actomyosin contractility and all the machinery in the cytoskeleton to the ECM, right? And so we think that, you know, the differences between amoeboid migration and mesenchymal migration, at least in the, the context of these Th1 cells, is actually quite similar, right? And the, the changes that you're seeing are more a result of this, this fast dynamics between the integrins and their ECM um, affinities and the fact that the changes in shape in the ECM, as again, Alba showed us last week, are, uh, sorry, the shape of the cell um, are all kind of crazy and protrusions in every direction, whereas the fibroblast is really flat and, and kind of coherently structured together. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, this work was really done um, all by Alexia Calle, a postdoc in my lab. Um, and then we are part of a, a great um, PO1 group um, that started out in Rochester. Deborah Full has now moved on to, to Cornell, um, but the rest of them are out in, in Rochester. Um, and then the PL lab, who has helped us a ton with this, getting this confinement set up. Um, and then everyone else in my lab, and then Jordan Beach's lab, where we kind of run a giant super group of cell migration and motility and, and cytoskeletal related things. So with that, I'd be happy to ask questions and or answer questions, not ask them. 
That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that Claire has raised her hand. So Claire, go ahead and ask the question. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Claire. That was, uh, I particularly loved your introduction. It was just uh, lovely. Thank you. And I like the talk too. <laughs> so I, what does amoeboid migration mean if it doesn't if it doesn't mean not using adhesions? So I think that in my, in my head, the way I think about it is it's the morphology and changes in the actin dynamics. I think that it, I would think about it as the fact that you're sending lamellipodia in multiple directions versus being more planar. So I think it's-, it's So you have lamellipodia if you, you can migrate, because I think, you know, originally amoeba, people studying amoeba defined uh, amoeboid by migration by the, the shape of the cell, right? And they talked about uh, protrusion mechanisms. I think that was sort of the next step was whether it was lamellipodial or pseudopodial. And then pseudopod, pseudopods, they can either be pressure driven or they can be lobopodia. Um, yeah. So I really think that it, like trying to fit, fit these things in mechanistic, I mean, in, in those two baskets, I just don't know that it's really useful because all it really means is the shape of the cell, that it's like a booger instead of like a, like a, a fried egg, you know? Yeah, I think that you're exactly right. I think that, you know, the mechanism behind the protrusion could obviously change, you know, whether like you said, you're pressure driven or your your R23 network kind of driven pushing against the membrane. But I think that in terms of your gel sol lobopodia driven, right, any of those other kind of things, as long as you get a protrusion, if there's still the, the proteins in the membrane that can then interact with the ECM, like I think that at that point, you know, you're still talking about coupling mechanics of what's going on inside the cytoskeleton to the ECM to, to cause migration, right? And that the, the coupling pieces are actually the same. Um, for the most part, I don't want to exclude that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like for a while there, everybody was thinking, oh, amoeboid migration means that it's integrin independent, but you're saying right. it's it's not. So I feel like, yeah, I think it's just about the cell shape. That's sort think, of the bottom line, which, which, you know, why does that even, it's like, doesn't even matter anymore. I feel like we have to just be, I yeah, don't so know. I, I mean, I struggle with the exact same thing that you're saying. Like, I think that, you know, the idea that it's it's all just integrin based and it's just uh, a core, not all but maybe most of it's integrin based and it's a function of what you change your shape is is um, not as necessarily as exciting as maybe we got into it thinking that we could find these integrin independent mechanisms um, but i also think it's also the, a much simpler kind of answer right in the sense that if you can have these integrins and you can interact with the, the substrate you probably use you them, do right? it yeah right? of course like it, right it's just like most <laughs> obvious solution is like i'm not going to create a whole new method of migration if i have all the machinery in place to do it again. So I, you know, I think that thinking about it and reframing it as this idea of the shape. And I think that there's something with the kinetics, like the fact that when you put a fire blast in a 3D environment, you also don't see these big chunky adhesions as much as well. Is it really coming down to this idea that if you don't have a high affinity of your surface, either through high density or strong affinity, then you can't form these larger structures, but it doesn't mean- Yeah, that and you also don't like flat, I mean, the higher affinity also causes you to flatten flat, out a whole lamellipodia and put large area in contact. So I really think it's about the, 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 the amount of contact area of contact area is yeah, what I, defines it. I would okay, I'll let somebody else talk though. All right, uh, Shashank, I think you were the next one. So please go ahead and ask your question. Hi Patrick, good to see you. Good to Hi. see you as well, Claire. Uh, I had a, by the way, great, wonderful talk. I had a much simpler question. You had this uh, experiment where you were squeezing the cells from the top and the bottom, yeah. and you were seeing uh, adhesions form on both surfaces. Yeah. Does the cell know, or is there any indication to know, top from the bottom? No. So, I mean, the one that I showed you happened to have more on the bottom than the top, but we have examples where they're more on the top than the bottom. Um, so as far as it's concerned, I mean, you can actually do the calculations out if you want to about the effects of gravity in fluid and they're negligible, right? I mean, they're right, of course. a force that a, a single myosin head can produce, right? It's, it's not the thing that's driving it. So in this case, um, they, they interact with whatever's around them, right? So they have it both the top and the bottom and they find a ligand and they send out a protrusion, they change their shape, they grab it and they move. So they don't, they don't necessarily know a top versus bottom. It's just wherever they can interact with the something, right? Wherever there's ECM present. Okay, now I think at that scale, you have absolutely right. 
gravity shouldn't matter, but I was just kind of curious if there's any indication at all that there was some sensing going on that we weren't aware of at this point. We have not seen anything yet. Um, okay. we, like, we have examples of both preference for top and preference for bottom, and it seems to be, and they, they switch mid-migration. So you'll see a cell that's kind of mostly on the bottom and kind of transiently interact with the top, and then you'll see it switch and be mostly on the top and the bottom. So it's, it really seems stochastic in our hands. Okay, and the other, uh, my last question was, the experiment with FPS, where you had passivated surfaces and you're putting FPS. Yeah. Uh, I'm, under, I'm, I'm assuming that FPS is not able to interact with the surface. So I think this is where it goes back to the difference between doing it on a glass surface that you passivate and doing it on the gel. So I think that it's almost impossible to perfectly passivate a glass surface, okay. right? And so my guess is that there's small little gaps where then you could get a, like ECM to sit down and stick electrostatically to the, the, to the glass substrate underneath, just okay. like you do when you normally coat, you know, a glass with a, some fiber or something. But however, when you move to the, the acrylamide gels, because those have no ligands at that point, right? There's nothing that can bind it. I think that's truly a much better representation of a pure passivated surface. And then when you have FBS, it still doesn't matter. They still don't migrate very well um, and they don't want to get through that area. Thank you. Okay, next I think that Anna can ask a question. Yes, hi, thank you for that nice talk. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to make a comment on this whole idea of amoeboid migration. And um, I really don't think that uh, there's evidence for it to be an integrant independent migration. So I think yeah, you're actually correct. That I think, and I was wondering, do you notice, because like in neutrophils in vivo, as compared to um, macrophages, um, they don't make very organized uh, paxillin puncta. Um, so there, there is that difference. And when they're moving very rapidly, they don't tend to have as organized um, uh, focal complexes. So the, the question is, do you notice that? So I often associate more organized um, adhesions with the stopping process. Do you see that with the T cells as well, that when they're making more organized um, focal complexes, they tend to be moving a little bit slower? So or we haven't do done any that? systematic analysis. So it'd be a great thing to go back and look at our data and try to see if you know the larger things or the more we see if those are the cells that move a little bit slower. Um, but I think that, in our head, what we think is that, you know, because these are such transient interactions and what we've shown is that you need such a tiny amount of ECM to even get them to start migrating and that these adhesions are small, likely in the neutrophil where you're not seeing the big one, the big uh, plunk or chunky things, you're still having small accumulations of them that are just sub diffraction. You're not actually being able to resolve them, but they're still there and doing the same kind of things. And so, yeah, when you get slower and you can accumulate more of them, then you see uh, larger plaques and other things. So I, I would 100% guess that if we went back through and looked, the slower they were, the more we'd see the adhesions um, and the, the, you know, the tinier adhesions would be the faster cells. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Erin, please go ahead. Hi, that was a really great talk. Um, we work on cell migration mostly in the gut. And so when we're thinking about how these cells migrate through, like I really liked, you know, kind of squeezing between two different um, substances or trying to like, you know, your cat analogy essentially, have you ever thought about looking at what happens when you have different integrin ligands that are exposed either like on the top or the bottom? Because we're looking at cells that are like migrating between matrix and epithelium. And then, you know, is that something that, that you've looked at? Um, so first of all, it's a great question and one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And so it was actually one of the first ones we thought we'd get to that we would basically take a surface of fibronectin and put one of ICAM on the top and then see preferentially which they want to. And then it got really hard to even get them to migrate at all. And so we got sidetracked with just trying to figure out how to make them migrate. And so that's definitely down the road. That's the next thing to do. We can clearly make surfaces on either side with different things. And, you know, the one we actually want to do is we want to micro pattern them so that they have different orientations, basically. And so then you could see preferentially, do they migrate along the direction? of the fibronectin versus the ICAM or vice versa, or do they stochastically not care? Um, so it's a great question. We have not explored it. I would really love to. Um, we just haven't had time. Um, and just one more follow-up. So, I mean, I, I guess in a model where you're kind of looking at gels, it's not as much of a concern, but like, is there a way to model, you know, the effect of like nuclear deformation? So like if you had your leg up underneath and the cat had to get like under your leg and is still moving the blanket around just to continue this analogy, right? Yeah. Um, are you able to look at those kinds of interactions? We, so we haven't really looked at them yet. Um, the, the confinement height that we use five microns is enough to basically keep the cell between the two surfaces, but not enough to actually deform the nucleus. 
Um, and so we haven't really tried to probe if we squish them even further and we kind of make these obstacles where they have to try to squeeze and through the, the nucleus. There's been a lot of people who've looked at nuclear mechanotransduction and there's uh, other associated signaling pathways that go on with that. We haven't touched that here yet. I think that's somewhere we could go in the future, but we're pretty convinced here that the nuclei are fine, that we haven't squished them so much and that's not, um, not a, an obstacle for them to overcome in this context. Um, but certainly in the, the, the body, they're gonna encounter regions where um, you know, that is going to be uh, an issue and that's going to have its own signal cascades and effects and other kind of stuff. Great, thanks. Okay, and then we have some questions in the chat box. So Anna is uh, asking, T cells exhibit different modes of migration compared with mesenchymal and epithelial cells using the amo amoeboid migration and normal do not form focal lesions. When you force the cells to migrate on ICAM or fibronectin, do they respond to different concentrations of fibronectin or ICAM? So we haven't played with concentrations of ICAM. Um, we showed in some of the earlier slides that if we titrate in the amount of fibronectin when we took out FBS, that we could see an increase in migration speed and velocity and, and displacement and all those things. So uh, I do think that you can titrate this effect to, to some kind of level and effect. Um, and we haven't, we haven't explored that extensively, but you know the data we have, I think, suggests that that's a reasonable assumption. And then Ben Fabry is asking, the gap opening between the two uh, polyacrylamide, polyacrylamide layers appear to extend, uh, extend way beyond the cell outline. How st stiff is the gel and what happens when you change the stiffness? What is yeah. the pressure with which the polyacrylamide layers are pushed together? Um, so, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, hi Ben. Um, so the, the gel itself that we're using is about 250 pascals in, in terms of shear modulus. So it, it's much on the lower end of kind of stiffness. Um, and what we see often is that the, the gap that you see between the two gels is actually a function of the density of cells that are around it. So you can imagine if you put in a bunch of other cells that that allows you to, to withstand the kind of pressure of the gel on top of it. So the way we actually do this is we have our normal bottom gel with uh, the cells on top of it. We flip another cover slip upside down and we have a, a pillar, uh, a PDMS pillar that we put on top of that that kind of applies a small pressure to those two surfaces. So we've never gone through and measured the exact amount of pressure that we, we are applying to push on it. Um, we just know that as the cell kind of migrates away that, if, you know, as it gets far enough away, then you see it, it, it reclose that kind of gap. Um, so I think it's a, it's a fascinating question. We've played a little bit with substrate stiffness and trying to see what happens when we get them too stiff. Um, and try to sandwich them between them. If you get them very stiff, they don't migrate anymore. Um, and presumably because they, they no longer can generate the, the requisite forces to actually deform that gel and push it out of the way. Um, we haven't nailed down exactly what that stiffness is um, per se, um, but it, it does hit a, a threshold where it no longer works. So hopefully I got all your questions. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. And then Anna is also asking, what kind of confinement were you using? Two micrometers, three micrometers or five micrometers? And then you see these cells that would switch uh, for a more bit faster migration than uh, usually to be fast in our body. Um, so the first part was uh, for all the, the the like the PL level confinement we're, we're using two PDMS or like using a PDMS confiner that's done at five microns. Um, we've tried at 10 microns and 10 microns is too big of a gap to combine the T8, the T cells. If you get down to um, two and a half microns, which we've also done, they still migrate. Um, they tend to take a little bit longer to get going. Um, and it's a little unclear what drives that process, but they eventually start migrating. It just takes a few more minutes. Um, so that's the level of confinement. And I totally forgot the other half of the question. Uh, so do these, when they are confined, do, they think, do you think that they migrate faster than what they do in vivo in our bodies? Oh, yeah. I mean, so uh, I think that they're, they're migrating comparably. I don't want to say that they're exactly migrating, you know, you know, a little bit faster, a little bit slower. I think it's on the right order of magnitude. I think that when you do all these kinds of things, there's, you know, measurement error and other kinds of stuff. And, and clearly the, the complexity of the environment matters, how much what we talked about if you had ICAM and fibronectin present at the same time. So we haven't played with all those kinds of things. I would say that ballpark we are in the right area of them migrating, um, but I, you know, I don't want to say it's exactly faster, slower, or dead on. It's it's somewhere in that, that regime. Right. And then Aditan is asking, or he's saying first, amazing work and presentation. And do you also see a similar path or footprint creation when cells are sandwiched between two polyacrylamide gels instead of a polyacrylamide gel together with an agarose gel? Uh, yes, we do. Um, we've we've seen no real difference between the two. Um, so it, it seems to behave the exact same kind of way. The, doing it with the agarose on top is just a little bit easier. So we sometimes default to that, but um, mechanistically and in terms of results, we don't see any difference between the two. 
Okay, great. And then Raghavan uh, is asking, this might have been coming in before the, the questions were asked from the from the chat, but how do cells differentiate the top and bottom while confined? The stresses from the TFM were not similar between the top and bottom. I assume both are same gels and are coded with the same ECM proteins. Yeah. Also in the confined experiments in a 3D view, the number of adhesion points between top and bottom were different. Yeah, so again, I think this just comes down to stochastic differences. I think they sometimes interact at the top, sometimes the bottom. Uh, you know, the example I showed you happened to be more on the bottom. I would say sometimes we see a slight preference for the bottom because we plate those first. So there's just longer time to, to get there. Um, but if you let them migrate after 20 minutes, there, there doesn't seem to be any difference between top versus bottom. Okay. And then the last question is uh, by Elke, and he's saying uh, beautiful work. Concerning the retraction structures, could they have microsome like functions? Yeah, we don't, I mean, it's a fascinating possibility and I don't have a clean answer for you. Um, it's something that we're, we're interested in trying to figure out. I mean, it, it, those retraction like structures might also be what's allowing them, you know, to follow the same path, right? We think that they're, they're likely connected, but what's in them, I don't have any idea. Yeah, that. related to that, I also have a question. So, uh, because you saw very beautifully that these cells are following these tracks or where a cell had been going before, do you think that uh, the amount of cells that are capable of following another cell would be lower if the, the cells would be uh, seeded less densely so that, you know, you lose the gap, so you would only have then basically if there yeah. is ECM leftover or some proteins from the microsomes that would be left over. That's um, a great idea and one we haven't played with right now. It's been more just dumb luck. You know, we've, we take an image and we see that they follow along the same one, but we haven't tried to play with uh, density of cells to see if we can get them to follow more or less. So. Yeah. Okay, great. Fun. Thank you. Uh, there's no more questions in the chat and I don't see any raised hands. So I think that's it unless anyone has some last questions. If not, then thank you very much, Patrick. It was a beautiful talk, very impressive. Thank you very and much. Thank you so much fun. for coming to this seminar. Bye. Bye.